Good evening and welcome to the uh, Monday evening meetings of the Salem City Council. We're going to begin tonight with the Urban Renewal Agency. If the uh, recorder would please call the roll. Board Member Stapleton. Here. Board Member Anderson. Present. Board Member Phillips. Here. Board Member Leon. Board Member Gonzalez. Here. Board Member Hoy. Here. Board Member Nordyke. Here. Board Member Lewis. Here. And I'll go back to Board Member Leung. Absent, Chair Bennett. Here. Okay, uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Councilor Hoy, do we have any additions or deletions? No. Okay. I have no one signed up for public comment, so we'll go to the consent calendar. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. The consent calendar consists of item 3.1A, the May 10th, 2021 draft urban renewal agency minutes. That concludes the consent calendar. Okay, any discussion? Okay, could you call the roll, please? Board Member Hoy. Aye. Board Member Nordyke. Aye. Board Member Leung. Aye. Board Member Lewis. Aye. Board Member Anderson. Aye. Board Member Phillips. Aye. Board Member Stapleton. Aye. Board Member Gonzalez. Aye. Chair Bennett. Aye. All right, motion passes. Uh, don't have any business. We have uh, other business. We're going up to public hearings. Um, I'll open the public hearing on the fiscal year 2022 Salem Urban Renewal Agency budget. Okay, the Urban Renewal Agency will now hold a public hearing uh, regarding the fiscal year 2022 Salem Urban Renewal Agency budget. The hearing will begin with a staff presentation and no individuals signed up to testify. Good evening, I'm Josh Eggleston, the city's budget officer. <clears throat> no formal presentation this evening. Uh, the Urban Renewal Agency Budget Committee recommended a budget to the agency board on May 5th, 2021. The agency board is required to hold a public hearing on the recommended budget in compliance with state public budget law. This evening's public hearing was noticed in the Statesman Journal on June 3rd, 2021. <clears throat> there has not been any public comment received on the URA budget. Following the public hearing, staff recommends that the Urban Renewal Agency Board deliberate on the Budget Committee recommended budget and direct staff to return on June 28, 2021 with a resolution to adopt the fiscal year 2022 Urban Renewal Agency budget. At that meeting, staff may request the Agency Board to amend the fiscal year 2022 budget approval made this evening to include any rebudgeted purchase orders or carryover projects from the fiscal year 2021 budget, which staff are currently identifying. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Eggleston? All right, Councilor Hoy, do you have a motion? I move to direct staff to return on June 28, 2021 with a resolution to adopt the Budget Committee's recommended FY 2022 Urban Renewal Agency budget. Second. Second by Anderson. Do you want to discuss that? I think we had quite a bit of discussion during the uh, budget process. This is the exact budget that we uh, recommended at that time, and I think we're good to go. Great. Any any further discussion on this? Uh, would the recorder please call a roll? Did Board you member. Clo close the public I'm hearing? Sorry. Did someone have something to say? Sorry, did you close the public hearing? Nope. Nope. I closed public hearing. Thank you. Now we'll call a roll. Thank you. Thank you. Board member Nordyke? Aye. Board member Lewis? Aye. Board member Stapleton? Aye. Board member Anderson? Aye. Board member Phillips? Aye. Board member Leung? Aye. Board member Gonzalez? Aye. Board member Hoy? Aye. Chair Bennett? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Have no special orders of business. We have an information report. Any questions on the information report? Then uh, we are adjourned.
Hey, I'm going to call to order the uh, Salem City Council meeting for Monday, June 14th. If the uh, recorder would please call the roll. Councillor Stapleton. Here. Councillor Anderson. Present. Councillor Phillips. Here. Councillor Leung. Here. Councillor Gonzalez. Here. Councillor Hoy. Here. Councillor Nordyke. Here. Councillor Lewis. Here. Mayor Bennett. Here. Okay. Are there any additions or deletions, Councillor Hoy? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move additions, deletions, and a reordering of the agenda. Okay, I'll second. Thank you. Uh, on item 3.3E, the release of city interest of a portion of an unopened alley abutting Pioneer uh, Cemetery, we have a revised quick claim deed correcting the omission of the grantee's name. And as for the reordering of the agenda, I would like to move item hot, I, I'm sorry, I would like to move item five ahead of item four. Okay. That will give us an opportunity to hear from the chief of police before we consider the budget. I'll second that motion. Okay, so that will go, I think I've got it. There he is. Okay. Okay, second by uh, Nordyke. Any discussion? Okay, if you please call the roll. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Motion passes. Okay, we'll go then to uh, public comment. Oh, we missed council manager. Oh. I did anyway, Councilor manager comments. We didn't miss it, that's where we're at. That's where we're at, yeah. But I was gonna miss it. I was planning on just passing this one by, get done. I wasn't gonna you let got you. something to say then, Hoy. What'd you do this week? I have a lot to say. Tonight. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I, I feel the need as uh, the council president to sort of set the record straight on an item. Uh, I, I'm concerned about uh, the public's perception of our authority on the casino. Uh, I received a, ma a mailer at my home addressed to me uh, that suggested that if you call your local legislator and city councilor today and voice your opposition in this case, your opinion either way, it doesn't matter, that somehow, and in this case, it's uh, Councilor Virginia Stapleton, and I'm not sure uh, why there's a thought that she could change this. Even if she had four people on this council who agreed with her for a majority on this council, the Salem City Council does not have any authority on whether there is a casino located in the city of Salem. Now, we might have an opinion and we might be asked to voice our opinion, but we have no authority to grant or stop a casino in the city of Salem. And I think it's really important that people understand that, that we don't have a formal role here. If you want to weigh in to where your, where your opinion would be heard by someone who actually has authority, call the governor maybe call your U.S. senators, but the Salem City Council doesn't have any authority on this. And so I just wanted to set the record straight because I've seen many uh, TV commercials and then I got this mailer at home and I'm figuring if I got this mailer, probably a lot of other people did. And I don't want people to waste their energy lobbying us when we don't have any authority. If we had some authority, I'd say, bring it, tell us everything you want. I mean, I appreciate knowing what people think, but I don't want them to tell me what they think, thinking I can do something about it because we can't. So thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Nordyke. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Councilor Hoy. I appreciate that. We have a lot on our plate, but it's always helpful to clarify what we don't have on our plate, right? So thank you for that. Uh, a few things coming up that I want the community to know about. Um, first of all, I'm thrilled to see a proclamation relating to Juneteenth coming up. For those of you who don't know, Juneteenth memorializes June 19, 1865. This was a date in which former slaves in Texas 
learned of the Emancipation Proclamation that had been signed two and a half years earlier. And that will be effective June 19 of the year 2022 statewide. And I congratulate our legislature on making this happen. And I hope that when that rolls around, people will take an opportunity to educate themselves on what Juneteenth means in our nation's history and as an opportunity to reflect on the intersection between racism, generational trauma, and mental health. Nikki Keen, a PhD, writes about the lingering impact of trauma that is caused by slavery and institutional racism on the descendants of the enslaved and how those mental health struggles can continue to have ramification decades and decades and generations after the fact. So I, again, am grateful to see the passing of Juneteenth here in the state of Oregon as an official holiday. On another note, serious note, I want to encourage folks to take a look at the Home Youth and Resource Center, which is our local day center for homeless youth. The last time I spoke to the Salem-Kaiser School District, we had about 1,000 youth that they designate as homeless under the federal definitions, which includes not just kids living on the streets, but kids who have a great deal of housing instability and insecurity, kids who might be couch surfing, staying with friends, and so on, which obviously creates a lot of challenges when you don't have a stable place to stay. How do you have a stable place to go to school and do what is expected of you? The Home Youth and Resource Center is a day center that teaches teens life skills, that gives them a safe space to do their homework, that provides job training, that teaches them how to cook in their own kitchen, and in general just guides teens towards a better life, and to give them those adulting skills that every kid needs but not every kid gets. It can be little things like, for example, setting them up for job opportunities and teaching them the importance of showing up on time for their first job. These are the skills that will go a lifetime. And so if you go to my Facebook page, Salem City Councilor Vanessa Nordyke, I posted a video tour of the Home Youth and Resource Center with the organizers. And I encourage you to take a look Early on in the video, I asked them what kinds of donations they're looking for from the community. So if you're interested in donating things like a gently used backpack or other school supplies and things that kids need, please log on and take a look at it. And then last but not least, I'm really excited about Make Music Salem, which is coming up. It's going to be on June 21st, and it's all about music by the people for the people. It's an invitation to all musicians, amateur and professional, to sign up to make music and to play at venues that are going to be available around the city. So you'll want to go to makemusicsalem.org. I know that as we are slowly but surely emerging from this pandemic, this is an opportunity for us to reconnect with our neighbors and to repair the damage that's been done to our collective and our individual mental health. So please avail yourself of these opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Anderson, did I see your hand up? No? No, I do now. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, okay. Mr. Mayor. I, um, Luddite that I am, I had too many things off, but now I'm here. Um, uh, la last night, I, um, I thought I sent uh, an email by my telephone to the mayor and the city manager and the council president asking to uh, uh, pull item uh, uh, three point, no, excuse me, um, uh, 3.3D from the agenda. That's the lease with Weeks uh, Berry Farm. And apparently I didn't do that. So with the council's permission, I'd like to pull that from the consent calendar before we get to it. And it's three point, just sec, Tom. Yeah. 3.3 uh, D. D. Yeah, and I was kind of made aware of that because Mr. Dameron, who was here earlier, sent me an email about it and he didn't indicate that it was pulled. So I don't know if he's gone, but I'm sure that uh, 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 someone else here on the staff uh, uh, can respond to this. And uh, I, I will also talk about, if they can, I see what Mr. Dameron said in his email. I just want to discuss this a bit. Okay. We're good. Thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yes, 
Councillor Stapleton. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to the Highland Neighborhood Association. Uh, last month, uh, Councillor Gonzalez and I went and we met with literally, they were down to two people. We had one person who was a board member and um, of course, with their bylaws, they couldn't uh, couldn't do anything with just one member. And so I went back this last week to their second meeting of the year, actually since COVID. Um, and we had 10 people show up and enough people volunteered to be, I uh, have a full board. Uh, they are planning their summer neighborhood barbecue. And it was just so great to sit back, uh, watch them all come together and get really excited about planning. And they wanted to start a community garden and get, um, the city forester there to talk about street trees. And it was just really positive and upbeat and to see so many people who had never been before uh, come together and step up and really uh, lead their neighborhood in this way. It was just really, really great. So thanks to all you volunteers out there uh, really doing the work on the ground and making your neighborhood a great place to be. So thanks so much. And which neighborhood association was it? That was Highland. Highland, oh God, yeah. down to you. That's been a real active one over the years. I had that one for quite a while. That's, that's great to hear they're back. That's really yes. excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Councillor Phillips. Thank you, Mayor Bennett. Um, just another update. So just a reminder, uh, I'm Trevor Phillips and I'm an emergency room doctor here in the community. Um, and I wanna once again, encourage people to avail themselves of the safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines. Um, as a state, we are so incredibly close to achieving the 70% mark of eligible people getting vaccinated, which is tied with, you know, decreasing um, the mandates and restrictions that we've all been doing um, to save lives here in our region. So, uh, you know, there's only 71,000 more Oregonians need to get vaccinated for the state of Oregon as of today to achieve that 70% mark. And here in Marion County, it's a little less than 17,000. Uh, at Polk County, it's just a thousand more residents to get vaccinated, and we achieve that 65% uh, local mark and get Oregon closer to that 70% mark. So I would be surprised if we're not just past or at that by the next time we meet in two weeks um, as a state. So you know, it's it's they're safe, effective, they're free, and uh, I've heard some official rumors that you may qualify for up to a million dollar lottery or. $10,000 one per county and, and some people under the age of 18 may qualify for a scholarship. So there's many reasons, um, you know, life-saving and health benefit wise to do it without those motivations. But if you needed a little additional motivation, there are reasons out there to do it. So thank you so much for this time. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Nye Ithim one, Jose Gonzalez. You know, I always introduced myself in one of the many languages spoken in Salem. Today it was Korean. I, uh, as I see our president going around on his first foreign trip, I was just thinking about my time in South Korea. Um, it's also timely that Chief Womack is going to be presenting today. Last week, we he and I, um, I helped him set up a tour of Northeast Salem businesses across different industries. They shared how they currently engage with the city and Salem PD, and each and every one of them reached out back to me, thanked me, and was really grateful for the time our chief spent with them. And they felt it was not it was not only a good use of their time, but they felt like it was a new beginning, you know. And thanks, uh, Cancer Nordyke, for um, reminding people about Juneteenth and what it is. But also there's a celebration, a Juneteenth celebration at the Seat of Faith Ministries. This actually on the 19th, Saturday. Uh, it, they're located at the corner of... Uh, winter and market street and it's a, also a vaccination event so my daughter will be getting her second vaccination that day and i invite everybody whether or not you need a vaccination to uh join us thank you mayor thank you very much counselor anyone else yes counselor leung um thank you mr mayor um good uh, good evening everybody I want to kind of actually start off with some greetings that are that make up my family, and it's actually two different um, languages, Ranalim, Nehoma. And these are words from the communities that make up my family. Ranalim is hello in Chukis or Hokies from the Micronesian community. Nehoma is in Toisan, which is a native dialect from a small village in China. Before I start talking about a few activities I've worked on for the past month, I want to include a land acknowledgement. It is a 
A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects Indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between the Indigenous peoples and the traditional territories. To me, it is important that we as Council start our meetings this way, and I hope that we can consider doing this for future meetings, or if not, for it to be a part of the habit as part of at least one Councillor's comments or statements. Today and all days, we honor and acknowledge Indigenous peoples and rightful peoples of this occupied land, the Clathmoc tribe of the Southern Oregon Plateau, the Burns Paiute of the High Desert East, the Kolokwe of Southern Oregon's Coastal Forest, the Confederate tribes of Grand Round and Northern Coast Range, the Cow Creek Band of Umqua in the Southern Oregon foothills, the Confederate tribes of Umtilla in the Blue Mountains, the Confederate tribes of Salitz in Oregon's Northern Rainforest, the Confederate tribes of Coos, Lower Umqua in Siosla on the windblown Southern Coast, the Confederate tribes of Warm Springs on the sunny Eastern slopes of the Oregon Cascades, and all indigenous communities who hold ancestral ties to this land. I have four brief updates that I want to share with folks. Um, one, um, it's a personal one. I just finished my third year as a PhD student at Oregon State University, so go bees. Um, I have one more year or so to go and I'll be done. Um, second, I had received my COVID vaccine 19, my second one, about two weeks ago. And um, the result was I was tired for a few days and I did have a sore arm, but otherwise I was doing great. Um, the last weekend of May, local organizers had held a commemoration for George Floyd with a peaceful rally downtown with inspiring speakers. I watched parts of the event that was streamed online. I would like to say a quick thank you to community organizers and local organizations and for community businesses for hosting the event. May, as you all may recall, was also Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and there were a number of activities centered on Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, including stories from home, cooking demonstrations, cultural singing and performances. In addition, Saturday, June 5th was a Marshall East Constitution Day event. Mayor Bennett and I had attended and provided remarks. And I believe someone mentioned this earlier, um, but if not, I wanna make sure it is mentioned that June is an important month for black indigenous people of color communities as well. One of the most important, um, in addition to being Juneteenth is that June is also Pride Month. Every year, the LGBTQI plus community celebrates. The activities that are celebrated, observed, that influence the LGBT community has been like, all around the world. And does anyone know though why June specifically was chosen? Because that's when the Stonewall riots took place way back in 1969. If you look up information on the Stonewall riots, you may learn a thing or two. Local organizers are also holding an event on Saturday, June 18th at Riverfront Park starting at 3 p.m. to onwards. And I'd, I'd like to end my sharing with a quote from Margaret Cho. The power of visibility can never be underestimated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I had the opportunity to participate in a groundbreaking out on Lancaster uh, at the old Epping Homestead. It was going to become one of the uh, newest and I think really uh, badly needed uh, boys and girls clubs here in the community be serving that uh, uh, northeast sector of the community. It was quite a good uh, well attended and it's going to be just a really beautiful building. I think this is going to be a real fantastic addition. It's across the street uh, from Chemeketa Community College from the Bainema campus. It's uh, uh, the high school campus. It's a, it's going to be a really nice uh, uh, and and badly needed service out in that part of town. So I was pleased to be included. Okay, where are we? Mr. Manager. Uh, nothing this evening at this time. Okay, great, thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on then to proclamations. As was mentioned, uh, it's June and each year we uh, assist in celebrating Juneteenth with a proclamation. Uh, accepting the proclamation tonight is Dr. Reginald uh, Richardson, president of the, uh, say, excuse me, Salem Kaiser NAACP. Whereas neither the Declaration of Independence nor the Emancipation Proclamation included all the enslaved descendants of Africans and whereas when Union Major General Gordon Granger read General Order Number 3 in Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865, 
It contained the important words, all slaves are free, causing impromptu celebrations across the state as the long delayed news spread. And whereas Juneteenth Independence Day is the oldest and most widely known celebration of African-American emancipation and a time for revival meetings, family reunions and celebrations of freedom, and whereas in 1997, the 105th United States Congress passed Senate Joint Resolution 11 and House Joint Resolution 56 officially recognizing Juneteenth Independence Day. And whereas in 2001, members of the 71st Oregon Legislative Assembly passed Joint Resolution 31 that pro proclaims June 19 of each year as Juneteenth Independence Day, a day for a statewide celebration of dignity and freedom of all citizens. Now, therefore, I, Chuck Bennett, mayor of the city of Salem, do hereby proclaim June 19, 2021 as Juneteenth <clears throat> Independence Day and encourage residents to join in learning about and celebrating the contributions of African, that African Americans have made to our country, our state, and to our community. I want to be sure also uh, to mention that uh, House Bill 2168, establishing Juneteenth as an official state holiday, sits on the governor's desk awaiting her signature, which I assume will come quite soon. Now, is Mr. Richardson here? I just wanted to be sure. There you are. Dr. Richardson, how are you? I'm well, Mayor. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor and members of the City Council. In just a few days, we'll be celebrating Juneteenth the oldest celebration honoring the end of slavery in the United States. And though many of us may just be learning about the significance of this holiday, it's important to take time to recognize its place in American history and reflect on the long struggle for equal rights. And how far we have to go to honor the holiday, I encourage you to take time to reflect, learn and educate yourself, gaining greater understanding of our past, the struggles of African Americans, can all help us come together and forge a brighter future. On behalf of the almost 300 members of the Salem-Kaiser NAACP and the members of our community, I accept this proclamation and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Richardson. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. In just a second here. Okay, I've got uh, two people signed up for public comment. Corey Poole. Got three minutes, Corey. Hi there. Hi. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen here. Apologize, always takes a moment. All right, here we go. There we are. Um, thank you, um, honorable mayor and esteemed council members. My name is Corey Poole. I'm the chair of the Semka Neighborhood Association and my business is at 3100 Turner Road. I wanna start by expressing my thanks to public works staff and Salem police and park staff for helping to start the long process of restoring our neighborhood park. City staff moved and cleaned all the camps from the Beaver Grove picnic area in Cascades Gateway Park. While this represents a small uh, portion of our park, uh, seeing it free of garbage and campsites gives us hope that this once beautiful park can one day be enjoyed once more by all Salem residents. I would also like to congratulate city staff on restoring Walls Marine Park. As you can see, uh, Walls Marine Park um, appears to be clean and safe and ready for a wide variety of uses. Sadly, Cascades Gateway Park is still completely unusable by neighborhood residents or groups. The Cascades Gateway parking lot still looks like a cross between a uh, wrecking yard and a refugee camp. Uh, many camps still remain along the ecologically sensitive creek bank and adjacent to neighboring homes and businesses. 
Uh, trespass and crime also continue in the neighborhood as well. This individual spent over two hours breaking into carports and sheds last week, eventually stealing a bike and returning to his campsite in Cascade Gateway Park. Using photos, the owner of the bike actually tracked this individual down and took his bike back. Uh, when I asked why he didn't contact the police before confronting this homeless individual, he expressed that he had no confidence that the police would do anything to help in this situation. But I am glad he safely got his bike back and I'm glad nothing happened. Uh, this is why it's so important uh, to transition quickly from this dangerous unmanaged camping model to a managed model where homeless can safely camp and receive services that they so sorely need. Uh, managed camps that council has improved so far have worked and they need to be replicated citywide. Uh, I also hope that you will make it possible for Salem residents and businesses to contribute towards building some of these facilities. I know that I and other businesses uh, would step up to donate time and materials to help build secure camping options. Our city needs to redouble our efforts to address the needs of this population, and I hope that you'll support any and all funding requests that come before you regarding the expansion of housing and services to the homeless in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corey. Any questions for Corey? Okay, uh, Terry Finch. Hi, um, my name's Terry Finch and please forgive my, the informality because this is my first time attending one of your meetings. So um, I'm supposed to follow up after Corey pooled. I mean, that was quite a presentation. Um, one of the reasons I, I, I wanted to say something is because I, I live in South Salem and I travel to work twice a week and to the area of Lancaster and Market Street. And I see every day the carnage that is there. And I certainly sympathize with the homeless people and their plight, but it just appears that nothing's being done. And I just, my question is, what is being done about that? Because it looks like nothing's happening. Um, yeah, and, and the trash is heap is getting higher and higher. And it looks bad. And it also looks like we don't care. Like Salem says, hey, come on down. And the irony is, is that you've got in the, in the background is this huge flag that's flying over the car, the powers car dealership. And it looks dystopian. As I drive through there, I'm like, what is this? I mean, I just, I can't believe my eyes. And I, it, it seems like it was something that happened suddenly. Who are these people? Are they people who live in Salem and have been displaced? Or are they people who have come to Salem? Um, so it, it, are there any studies being done? Uh, any, what, you know, what's going on to try to get to the root of the problem? And, um, you know, and, and my suggestion is, can we have a task force or something uh, to, to address it, whether it's at the state level or local level? I mean, a task force like involving the police, the social services, you know, just something to address the problem because Doing nothing is going to cost us more in the long run than doing something about the problem. And that's all I have to say about that for now. Ray, I thank you very much. Trust me, we are as frustrated as you are. That is uh, state owned property. We really don't have uh, much ability there all along the freeway. If you notice all along the freeway and underneath but we have been talking with the state. I've talked with the governor about it. Uh, and I think we're moving toward permission to go in as part of a group to clean that up and work with the, the folks that are there. And we'll do that uh, as we were doing it in like Corey Pools area and in West Salem uh, with a package of program services and alternative housing. But it is, it's a horrible, 
horribly frustrating situation. Yeah. So please contact your legislator. That will help us. But uh, we, we also are in touch with them, uh, trying to get permission to go in there. OK. OK. Thank you very much. All right, I don't have anyone else signed up. So we will move on to the consent calendar. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move approval of the consent calendar with the exception of item 3.3D pulled by Councilor Anderson. Second. Second by? Stapleton. Uh, Stapleton, I'm sorry. So that leaves us with item 3.1A, the May 24th, 2021 draft city council minutes. 3.2A, the proposed fiscal year 2022 master fee schedule. Item 3.2B, dedication of city property as public right of way on Lansing Avenue Northeast and Silverton Road Northeast. Item 3.2C, transfer of fiscal year 2021 general fund and utility fund budget appropriations. Item 3.2D, general fund supplemental budget for unanticipated city expenses caused by the winter storm event. Item 3.3A, lease with a LL- I'm sorry, Aliliu, I can't say that word, Beauty LLC for retail space located at 195 Liberty Street Southeast in the Liberty Parkade. Item 3.3B, providing water service beyond city limits for property located at 4929 Auburn Road Northeast. Item 3.3C, intergovernmental agreement with the Marion County, I'm sorry, with Marion County for communication and dispatch services for the 2021 St. Paul Rodeo. Item 3.3E, release of city interest of a portion of unopened alley abutting Pioneer Cemetery. Item 3.3F, intergovernmental agreement with the Salem Area Mass Transit District for police services. And that concludes the consent calendar. Okay, any uh, discussion on the motion or any of these issues? Okay, if the recorder please call the roll. Councilor Leung. Councillor Leung? Aye. Okay. Councillor Gonzalez? Aye. Councillor Hoy? Aye. Councillor Nordyke? Aye. Councillor Lewis? Aye. Councillor Stapleton? Aye. Councillor Anderson? Aye. Councillor Phillips? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Okay. Motion passes. So we are now going to the chief. Am I, have I got that right, Chris? Okay. Yes. So Chief Womack, or did you want to start, Steve, or do you want to just turn it right over to the chief? Well, this uh, month or the end of last month marked uh, Trevor Womack six months with the city of Salem as police chief. And and both the chief and I thought it would be uh, a helpful opportunity for, for council to hear from the chief on his first six months, uh, initiatives that he's launched initiatives that he's led this department to launch and what's coming over the next uh, six months. Chief. Great, thank you. Stand by just for a second here. Let me get this presentation started. There we go. Is that displaying properly for everyone? Great. Well, Mayor and Council President and Councilors and City Manager, thank you for this opportunity tonight to present some information, a, a six-month update. As City Manager Powers indicated, it's been six months for me now. I'm very excited and proud of the work that we've already accomplished as an organization in just six months. We've gained more clarity around where we're headed going forward. And so I'm looking forward to presenting some of that information tonight and having a bit of discussion about it, hopefully. As a quick uh, preface and overview, I think many of you have heard me say this before, so it might sound familiar, but my general approach towards the first year was divided into three phases. And so the first phase was just an introductory phase where I invested a lot of time just introducing myself to the community and listening, learning, observing externally and within the organization as well. Second phase was involved in organizational assessment. We're just finishing that up now. And the second half of this year will be the third phase, which is all about strategic plan development. So 
specific to the organizational assessment, as we know, uh, even before I arrived, there was an independent assessment or independent performance audit underway that has now concluded and it resulted in 11 um, overarching findings from that independent audit. And then we've been in the process of conducting our own in-depth internal organizational assessment as well, focusing on T 10 key areas within the department. There's a lot of overlap between those. Um, a lot of the areas identified within the independent audit are also areas that we focused on and identified within the organization ourselves and have already began working on. So not too many surprises revealed from the independent audit. Also, uh, so diving into the first half of, the, of 2021, the first six months, the work that we've already started or accomplished. And I brought with me a philosophy into the organization, a policing philosophy that uh, rests upon two primary pillars. One's police, principled policing and the other being smarter policing. And principled policing, again, some of this will sound familiar, um, is really about our who we are as individuals, as an organization. So it's an, a focus on, for example, our police legitimacy through procedural justice. And while smarter policing is much more about, as the name implies, policing in very smart, effective ways. So being focused, data-driven with our decisions, smart strategies. So a few of the things that we've already been working on during the first six months related to the implementing of that philosophy. We highly value community input. We wanna make sure that the community has a voice into all that we do as an organization and we're transparent. So one of the first steps that we took was to add community voice or a community member on our officer candidate interview panels. So we can have direct input from our community as we're selecting and hiring new police officers. We're working now to create a procedural justice training cadre. So procedural justice, it can also be referred to as procedural fairness. And there's a lot of evidence and research behind this now that it's a proven way to build trust between the police and the community. So it's an evidence-based approach towards trust building. And it involves giving folks a voice, being neutral in our decision-making, um, treating everyone with dignity and respect in all situations, and acting in trustworthy ways. Those are the four tenets of procedural justice. So we're, we're creating a training cadre, a group of specialized officers and professional staff that will become, we'll, we'll go through a train the trainer course around procedural justice. And then they will work to organically grow and build a training curriculum around procedural justice tailored for the Salem Police Department. So we're gonna grow that in-house internally ourselves, which I believe is gonna be much more meaningful and effective for the organization. And this also relates to the next step. Uh, we've been working on initial steps in designing a police community trust building framework for the department and the city. And that's, that works well underway right now and it'll continue through the second half of the year. And then more, that's more on the principal policing side, but if you move over to the smarter policing side, we're looking at ways to better use data that we already have and centralize that and begin to create anal analytical products that can help us drive strategies for the department so we can make smarter decisions about our resources and our effectiveness as an organization. Three other areas that we've been focused on during the first half are accountability measures, addressing or at least acknowledging and beginning to try to address some of the staffing challenges that exist within the organization and protests. So more specifically to each one of those, for example, under accountability measures, we took what was typically referred to as the Internal Affairs, Office of Internal Affairs, renamed it as Professional Standards, a little bit more of a contemporary naming standard for that. And we doubled the capacity of our professional standards section. So previously there was only one sergeant um, conducting complaint investigations for the department, administrative investigations. We transferred a sergeant from a different area of the department into professional standards to double the capacity. And what that allowed us to do is two primary points there. Because we're centralizing all of those personnel investigations now by two well-trained um, supervisors, investigators, we get higher quality personnel investigations out of the unit. It also adds a layer of objectivity to those investigations. So previously, many of those investigations were handled by individual supervisors, sometimes the supervisor of the actual officer that was involved in the complaint. And so this removes that 
and provides a layer of objectivity there. So better quality investigations by centralizing it and increased objectivity. We're also revamping the intake and review process for those complaints. And this will be a longer term effort, but we've already taken a few initial steps to just completely update and reorganize uh, our full um, book of policies and procedures, our policy and procedural manual for the organization. Uh, regarding staffing, I've talked about a little bit this prior also, but uh, the, the end, for example, the end of the SRO program provided a bit of temporary relief for us. It, it didn't solve the staffing challenge we have, but when it comes to meeting our core function as a police department, I think there's two primary core functions for a police department. Number one, we need to be able to respond to emergency incidents, 911 calls, for example, effectively. So we need to be staffed up for that. And then we need to make sure that we can qu do quality investigations around crime, especially serious crime, um, two primary core functions of law enforcement. And so the end of the SRO program allowed us a little bit of extra relief there. We were able to take those six to eight bodies that were assigned to the school resource officer program, reassign those back into patrol, which provided a bit of relief. There wasn't a one for one gain there because those officers did already have some work that they were doing while they were assigned to the school district that now is being pulled back into patrol. Um, but it did provide some additional capacity for our core function on, on our emergency response. We're also, uh, in the midst of uh, an analytical uh, analyzing our shift structures and schedules to make sure that we're deploying, especially our patrol resources effectively and efficiently. So that works well underway. And a few examples under protests, for example, of how we've been trying to apply best practice around crowd management. We've increased our communication with the public and, and with all of you as elected officials as well. We centralize a lot of our information uh, by creating a, a single web page about protests where we clearly state our approach, our neutral approach towards protests, regardless of any political affiliations or, or speech that may exist that's contra the controversy. Uh, controversy. Um, and we created a frequently asked questions page to answer a lot of the common questions that we receive from the public about protests. We also clearly stated our priorities during protests about how we make our decisions in the middle of a protest. And more internally, we've improved training, some new equipment, and we've improved the incident management system that we use to manage these sometimes complex events. Three more focus areas for the first half, recruiting, hiring, retention. We're looking to improve our strategies there. Uh, training, looking at some new types of training that we're going to do as an organization, and transparency, being much more open with our information as a department. A couple specific examples under recruiting, hiring, retention. We're exploring some new partnerships, for example, with Western Oregon University and Salem Public, um, Salem Kaiser Public Schools Career Technical Education Center. What this is really about is clearly identifying and solidifying a career pipeline so that we can engage folks um, across the spectrum <laughs> from youth through college and beyond um, to gain interest uh, in becoming a police officer with the Salem Police Department. So some of those components already exist, but what we're doing here is trying to expand that and have a very clear strategic approach towards building a, a career pipeline. We've also implemented exit interviews for all employees who separate from the department. So I think you can gain valuable insight there, whether folks are just retiring or whether they're leaving to work for a different organization or find other employment. We want to hear from those folks to learn, you know, what drew them to Salem Police Department in the first place? Why are they leaving um, as they walk out the door? Are there any thoughts or insight that we might want to know that we can bring into the organization to make change? So we're doing those exit interviews now as well. Regarding training, we inc we're increasing the use of our new training simulator that was uh, donated. The community gifted that to us through the police foundation. So we're very appreciative of that. But we're going to use that to increase our training to reinforce decision-making skills with officers, de-escalation skills with officers um, right here within the building. We're also refocusing on our crisis intervention training. So we're even hosting a course here in the new facility later this month. Um, to provide all of our, the goal being that we're going to provide all of our officers with that enhanced crisis intervention training. About 30% of the staff have that already, and we're going to work through until all have received that training. And I mentioned procedural justice training earlier already. 
when it comes to transparency, we're developing some options now for making more data uh, available online to the public, communicating more, being more open and transparent. Um, we we're going to create a transparency hub, for example, or an open data portal. This is going to take some time, but we've taken some initial steps to work on that already. And, and another example would be posting, once we go through a process of revamping all of our policies, would be making those policies available to the public online. They're currently not posted online. And been working hard internally and externally to improve the communications as well. So just a couple of small examples there. Small examples internally would be the creation of a virtual employee suggestion box, for example, that provides every employee with the organization an opportunity to provide direct input to me as the chief of police with questions um, or thoughts. And we go through a process of answering every single one of those uh, questions and comments that we receive from employees. And then externally, I've talked a lot about the external communication that we're increasing as well. So where are we headed then? It's been a quick six months. I'm excited about where we're headed. We have gained more clarity about where we're moving as an organization. And this will be the second half of 2021 is that third phase of my first year that I mentioned. So it really will be a focus on developing a strategic plan for the organization so that by the time we reach January, we will have a new shared vision for the department, some, some clarity around where we're focused and headed. Um, so we'll be investing a lot of time and effort in building that strategic plan over the next six months. But we've identified four uh, so-called buckets of work that we're going to focus on, some focus areas for the next six months. Number one, around the idea of community engagement. Uh, Deputy Chief Skip Miller is going to be leading that effort for the department. Uh, it starts with some foundational work. And, and again, this is all going to be written into a three to five year strategic plan so that we can hold ourselves accountable to making progress, but specific to the work that we're going to start on without waiting for the strategic plan to be developed, um, we're going to begin the foundational work around developing a new community engagement model for the city of Salem that encourages more uh, collaboration and communication and problem solving with our, with our community. So we're going to be exploring the organizational structure and staffing. There's going to be a redistricting component to this. And so taking a look at the way the city is divided up into policing districts and see if that still makes sense for us as an organization and as a community. And it could be, it could result in a, a complete redistricting effort or, or repackaging of existing districts based on things like um, existing community identities or neighborhood groups, geographic boundaries, amounts of calls for service, types of crime um, to, to create districts that make sense within those parameters. And this, and the, the end goal here will be to develop a model that really supports and encourages much more community collaboration and relationship building with the officers in the community. The community engagement side, if you think about it with the policing philosophy, that was more about the principled policing side of the philosophy. On the other side, the smarter policing, we're headed towards an intelligence led policing model. And that's gonna be led by Deputy Chief George Burke. Uh, some of the short-term work, the foundational work that's going to occur there over the second half is there's a committee that we've already formed, and that committee is working to identify what data do we already have access to within the organization. It might be a bit siloed um, and in, in different systems, but how do we centralize that information and centralize a team to form a crime analysis or data analysis unit and begin to make use of that data and create analytical products? Then we want to find a management, develop a management structure to use that information, use that intelligence to, to focus and develop strategies that involve multi-pronged collaborative approaches. And so, for example, we maybe uh, work to identify if we're focused on a certain type of crime, whether it's property crime, for example, burglaries. And if we're able to identify both where those are occurring more frequently, but also more importantly, which... Uh, offenders might be more uh, at risk for committing a burglary and then specifically identifying strategies for each of those individual people about how to lower that risk and not lowering that risk just simply through enforcement, lowering that risk through a multi-pronged collaborative approach involving multi many partners. So it's not just about reliance upon arrest anymore. So, so that's where we're headed with an intelligence-led policing model. Two other buckets of work there. So around training, 
uh, our policy reorganization that needs to occur and update and diversification. Deputy Chief Steve Belshaw will be leading that effort for the department. We'll be exploring some new forms of officer training. I touched a little bit on that already. Further building out our procedural training, procedural justice training for the department and implementing that. Uh, a reorganization of the department policies, as I said, that's going to be probably a multi-year effort, but the end goal there will be to have a, a contemporary, modern set of policies that have had community input and review and are then made available for public display and working on new strategies to increase workforce diversity, not only at the intake of hiring new employees, but in diversifying organization up and down the ranks as well. And finally, the fourth bucket of work that I'm going to be a little more hands-on personally myself here um, is around police legitimacy and trust building with our community. So we've already began the design work on that. We want to finish that design and then begin implementation during the, six, the second half of this year. Again, this is all going to be incorporated into a longer strategic plan, but um, there's some foundational work that's going to occur over the next six months. This for me uh, is, is critical work. This for me is about community policing 2.0, for example. It's the next era of policing, and um, it's moving the organization forward in ways that, that builds deeper relationships and trust and incorporates the voice of, of underrepresented community members who perhaps feel they've never had a voice with their police department. Um, so we want to make sure we're proactively reaching out and establishing those connections and relationships so that we can give everyone a voice in how we police in this community. A key takeaway for me here in this area too, based upon my past experience uh, with my last agency and the related work we did there and what I've already learned here in Salem is that this work is difficult and challenging. It has to be called out as a priority. It takes executive leadership and it takes time, um, effort, uh, personnel resources. And so I need a little bit of help with this. And so we've decided to temporarily assign Lieutenant Deborah Aguilar to work with me on this project for the, for the second half of this year to make sure we, we think this out properly and we get it right and we design it right. Um, this does also take community engagement at this level, does take, as I mentioned, time and resources. And so the staffing challenges that we face as an organization are that can be a hamper here. So we need to keep that in mind, uh, but we're not going to use that excuse. We're definitely going to move forward. So with that, I am very excited about where we're headed. I'm, I'm optimistic. There's been some challenges for sure, but we've hit the ground running as an organization and we are making changes. The organization's changing and we're moving forward in some new ways. I think we're well on our way to solidifying a vision um, that'll, that'll turn Salem Police Department into a model for 21st century policing here in Oregon. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Chief. That was, uh, that was really good. And your report was, uh, was very interesting as well. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, my dog has decided to bark at the threat <laughs> level when I raise my hand. I apologize, somebody just knocked on my door. But Chief, I, I'm, I'm hoping you can hear me. Uh, you and I had a conversation during your hiring process about where I felt the department was and where I wanted to see it, where I thought it should go. And, and that was, we have a very good, we had a very good police department. And I really wanted the, our new leader to take it to sort of the next level. And I really feel like, as I've observed you over the past six months and this report tonight, I really feel like you've achieved that. And I'm very happy with the direction you're taking the department. And I'm very happy with this progress so far. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And just in response to that real quickly, I've been extremely pleased with the, the, um, the atmosphere within the organization, the willingness within the organization to move forward and make change, and embracing it. And then also with the community, I've, I've literally met and talked with hundreds of people already. And uh, across the board, the willingness of the Salem community to, to come forward and, and interest in engaging with the police department um, and helping the police department move forward in new ways. And so it's been, it's been really a, a good experience so far. So thank you. That's great. And I feel like you had a really solid foundation and you're taking it us into the 21st century using some of those 21st century policing models that are really critical. And I'm really, really glad to see it. Yep. 
Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. From a layperson's perspective, who does some, some, know something about law enforcement from my years as being a criminal defense lawyer, I, I concur with what uh, Councillor Hoy is saying, and I appreciate you, Formac, your willingness to meet with people from all sides uh, of the spectrum and all beliefs to try to uh, do the kind of policing you are interested in doing. Um, I have a, a question about uh, number page two of your report, and it goes back to the protest. Um, there's been a lot here because we're the capital, and there's a lot of people on all sides of the issue, and it's pretty tough for you as the police department to be in the middle of all this. Uh, and you indicate you've had on the ground learned experiences and best practices made improvements in training and equipment. That's all terrific, but I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Thanks. Sure, just as one example, there's a, a kind of a one pager that was posted by NYU University, uh, the policing project, I believe it is there. And they created a new best practice approach towards crowd management. And in checking ourselves against that, uh, we line up with that very well now. So those are the kind of efforts they were doing is taking a look at what what the profession has learned over the past year and what changes are, are being implemented. And are we doing that in Salem? Is that right for Salem? And it, and it appears that we are. So, for example, one concept would be much more of a negotiated management approach. So and, and I've been. I've been criticized for a lack of presence during some protests, but in fact, that's actually a emerging best practice <laughs> that's being a practice across the nation is a limited police presence because you don't want to inflame any situation. So you're prepared and ready, um, but you don't necessarily need to have a huge show of force um, at the start of every protest. And so it's basing our decisions on when and how much force to demonstrate or how much presence to show um, upon the circumstances as they evolve rather than just upfront. Okay. Councillor Nordyke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Chief Womack. I want to pass on community feedback that I continue to receive about our police department. And one would be to start out with the Oregon Department of Justice, where I work. We started a bias hotline a couple years ago. And unfortunately, we have seen a huge uptick in bias reports of hate crimes and other activities against persons of color and other uh, marginalized groups in our community. And I would just encourage you to make sure that uh, Ms. Aguilar and others in your department um, are uh, maintaining a connection with that bias hotline, because a lot of times people will call the bias hotline with reports of hate crimes and then the intention is to work with law enforcement wherever they have jurisdiction. So what I keep hearing from the community is that a lot of people are scared to report hate speech. They're scared to report hate crimes. And I know that this is where your investment in community engagement will speak volumes and will do a lot to overcome that trust gap. So I would just remind you of that because that's the feedback that I continue to receive. And as recently as last week, I continue to receive feedback from my constituents talking about how police handle protests. I know that's not an easy job, and I've seen a lot of protests in Salem, so I understand all too well how the environment, the sand seemingly shifts under your feet throughout the course of those events. And that advertising, how you're going to respond in minute detail ahead of time is far different, tactically speaking, than saying, in general, these are the principles, these are our policing priorities to keep people safe during protests without taking a position either way. But I can tell you, I don't know about my peers on council, but I continue to receive feedback along those lines. Community engagement is an ongoing challenge, and I know that a lot of folks uh, don't have enough faith to either lodge a complaint with the Community Police Review Board or to make a complaint to 911, and a lot of that has to do with something that's out of your control, which is that you don't do anonymous reports for state law reasons. So I see that these are challenges, but meeting folks where they are 
and doing so in a culturally competent way, I think is going to go a long way. So thank you for listening and I'll continue to provide feedback as it comes to me. I'll continue to bring it to you and your team. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks, Chief, again. It was great seeing you last week. You know, I, um, with regards to the redistricting, you know, I, one of the things I've noticed really quickly coming on council is our wards are layered in a certain way. Our neighborhood associations are layered in a different way. And then uh, your districts are a completely different way. And I don't know. I don't know what it's going to take for us to start aligning some of those, especially as some of these neighborhood neighborhoods are changing with construction and population increase. Uh, maybe it's time to start looking at how we're organized as a city. But I know, for example, you know, um, our councilor Stapleton, she has five associations she has to report to. You know, totally unfair compared to the rest of us. You know, I uh, have six, Jose. I have six. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on I'm on Stapleton side, Tom. You you have the time. <laughs> you know, uh, thanks though. Thanks for making a note of that. You know, I um in addition, the uh at, at those neighborhood association meetings, I can tell you that the officer report out is I've noticed that that's one of the key items. And the neighbors really love though that ability to talk to the officer that's in the area that knows the issues. And uh, I just noticed, of course, you know, if something comes up, there's priority, they got to go. But uh, maybe they're spread too thin because sometimes they miss them. You know, so it's, and, and the staff or nobody at that moment doesn't know if they're going to show up, so they sort of wait. So anyways, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the, the way the wards, the Neighborhood Association District, is if we can get them a little more closer together, I think it would help everybody. Thank you, um, yes. Mayor Bennett, it, it, yes. I think Chief, uh, Chief Womack can speak to part of, of the councilor's question or concern. Perhaps, uh, Chief, you could update council on uh, some uh, reassignments you're making for neighborhood association uh, participation. Sure. First, uh, I, I do see the neighborhood associations as, a, as an existing set of community groups that we can leverage to improve police community trust and relations. And so I don't want to miss that opportunity either. Um, and it's an opportunity for us as an organization to take a look at a more of a community policing mindset and approach is how we interact with our neighborhood associations. Um, but you're right, Councillor, as far as being spread thin, sometimes it's a little difficult to commit a, a district officer to attend a meeting when there might be an emergency that, that happens at the same time and then you just he or she can't attend the meeting. So unfortunately, we want to try to avoid that from happening as well. Uh, we've had for about a year now a lieutenant dedicated to attend most of the meetings. Um, and that lieutenant has taken a, a, a job as chief of police with up in Butte right now. So he's <laughs> exiting, unfortunately. But it gives us the opportunity there to kind of take a look at how we're going to reassign that work with our interaction with the neighborhood associations. So we're looking at that now. We will have... Um, Again, based on more of a community policing model, um, someone assigned to each group to make sure that we're, we're represented and that we're getting the input and working with uh, each group around their unique, you know, crime issues or community concerns to try to solve problems jointly together. So that's still in development, but we're committed to that and we're going to make that work. And then just personally, I've made a commitment to attend every single meeting. I have two this week um, that I'm attending, and so I'll continue to make myself as available as possible also. Thank you, Chief. Councillor Stapleton. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you so much, Chief. This was really great to uh, read this. I was on vacation this last weekend up in the mountains, and uh, my husband was laughing at me that I was reading your update in a hammock, which was, it was great. It was a great place to uh, read an update. Um, but I made some notes um, that I wanted to pass along to you, um, and I just really wanted to thank you for your great communication. Um, not only when we have big events, uh, when you're sending updates to uh, the council and keeping us informed of what's happening, but also when things happen in our wards, you know, sending us a quick text or an email just to keep us up to date on different things that are happening. I really, really appreciate that. Um, also, your quick responses to my questions, whether they're about something that are they, you know, I come up with random questions, at least I think so. Uh, you know, are they doing this anywhere in the U.S.? Have you ever heard of this before? Um, and you're always very gracious with your time and responding to me. Um, and a lot of times in really great detail and in depth, um, especially when 
you know, this, this world that we live in, there's a lot of tension and a lot of holding the balance and trying to uh, find the nuance. And you're always uh, really responsive to me and my questions. And I just really, really appreciate that. It helps me sort things out as I look at uh, the decisions we're making as a city. Um, and I also want to say thank you just from the very get go, uh, you taking the time to get to know me personally. Uh, you and I sat down for a long time and shared stories, and I feel like that's such a great place to start in a relationship like we have now, like council and, and the police chief, um, just to really get a good basis for where each other's coming from. I um, really appreciate that. And like you mentioned, um, visiting our neighborhood associations, I really, really appreciate your time. Um, and I just had a quick question off of Councillor Gonzalez's um, question about the districts or wards. Um, is there anything in your policies that would... I don't know how to say this. Uh, you know, we all um, are required to live within an area in order to represent that area. And is there anything like that happening with policing where people who are, uh, you know, charged with, with patrolling or, um, you know, committed to a certain area of town are actually living in that area of town? Is there anything like that? No, uh, there's there's not. There's no residency requirement. Uh, you know, I myself am seeking to live here in, in Salem. Um, but it also speaks to, you know, from my past experience, I see the value in residency requirements, but it also creates another barrier to your applicant pool. Um, and the environment we're in right now, it's so hard for competition for new police officers that it's, it's challenging sometimes to limit, you know, a geographic area for an applicant. Um, but no, there's no current requirement. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I remember we had somebody move into Inglewood, uh, an officer who was moving to town, and we were all so excited and thrilled to have him, but that, that didn't last long. He moved, uh, I think, somewhere other other area of town. So, um, but thank you for this update. I really look forward to the next six months and seeing how things progress. I know that this is the, you know, the long haul, we're in it, and uh, all this change is going to take a lot of time. And I just really appreciate all your work and effort behind the scenes. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Very good, Chief, thank you very much. Great job, uh, really appreciate it. I want to remind you one last time, or one more time, I guess, it's a town of almost 170,000 people. And we hear from a very, very small slice of that community at times. So uh, I, I'm really pleased the, the way you're doing this so deliberately. Uh, I, I think that uh, I want to kind of, we had a, we have had a really outstanding, well-supported police department. You're just making it better. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Trevor, did I see your hand go up? Uh, no, it's just a thumbs up, but I'll, I'll take it. Oh, quick okay. <laughs> you say that Trevor is awesome, and I'm talking about Chief Womack. Um, and just to echo the praise of all the counselors that's gone before me. You're doing a great job, Chief. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Chief. Okay, we're going to go then to uh, public hearing on state revenue sharing funds. Mr. Mr. Mayor, we need to cover the. the uh, oh, I'm sorry. Poll. We need to cover 3.3D. We won't take that under five then. Five was moved up before okay. public hearing, so we can finish that one off. Okay, Tom, you want to make a motion on 3.3D? I'm sorry, uh, Dan, I didn't understand, but I thought that was pulled and put it in that. So, okay. Um, I move the, uh, uh, the the recommendation for the farm lease uh, as contained in the staff report. Second. Second by Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I tried to pull this uh, yesterday unsuccessfully, uh, and here was my concern. I'm looking at this. And uh, I looked at almost 20 acres of trees that are going to be chopped down for berries. And I'm on the Climate Action Task Force. I know uh, the importance of trees in uh, reducing greenhouse gas or countering greenhouse gas emissions. I understand that we as a city have been working very, very hard uh, to increase our tree cover. And the, the point I really wanted to make was that we are going to be facing all sorts of decisions in the very near future about what we do to keep our planet alive. Um, and so that was my concern about this, uh, not about this thing in general, but just to see that we ought to be looking uh, at this through a climate action perspective lens, just like we've talked about looking at things through an equity lens. And Mr. Um, uh, 
Kundamaran wrote me an email which explains things a little better that they're hazelnut trees, uh, they weren't working, uh, the person who was leasing the place could not make a go of it with hazelnut trees. He, so he ended his lease and um, the uh, farmer, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Weeks, who was uh, successfully farming berries on the other side of some city owned properties asked for this lease. So I think this is a good thing. Uh, uh, but I just think we ought to be really careful when we look look at these sort of things with trees going down and i'll note that we have 6c and 6e today on the uh, uh information agenda and they're talking about the tree conservation plan of various uh, uh developments and how many trees will be replanted for trees that are in and i think that's a good thing too so i look forward to having some berries from the weeks berry farm when they're up and going and so uh I think we should approve this lease. Oh, good. So it's a farm use that continues as a farm use. Is that yes. what we're Yeah. Well, yeah. it's yeah, it's it's trees that are being taken down, but for very good reasons. Yeah. They're number one, they're filberts. Yeah. Um, okay. Anybody else? Okay, why don't we uh is there So we have a motion. Um, I moved. You moved? Yeah. We seconded it, so we'll yeah. have a vote. Call the roll, please. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Yeah, aye. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Motion passes. Okay, we'll go to 4A, a public hearing on state revenue sharing funds. I'll open that public hearing. The city council will now hold a public hearing regarding state revenue sharing funds. The hearing will begin, begin with staff presentation and no individuals signed up to testify. Hello again, Josh Eggleston, city budget officer. Uh, no formal presentation. Uh, to receive state revenue sharing funds, the city is required to hold two public hearings. The first public hearing is to discuss the possible uses of state revenue sharing, and that was held by the Budget Committee on April 28, 2021. This evening's public hearing, which covers the proposed uses of state revenue sharing funds, was noticed in the Statesman Journal on June 1, 2021. The proposed use of state revenue sharing fund in the amount of $2,267,520 as recommended by the Budget Committee, is an offset to the cost of providing police patrol services. City Council approval of this proposed use is signified by adoption of Resolution 2021-23. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? All right, Councilor Hoyt, do you have a motion? I move City Council adopt Resolution number 2020-23, electing to receive a share of certain revenues from the State of Oregon General Fund. Okay. I'll, I'll second it and uh, close the public hearing, right? I should have closed it first and then take the motion. So uh, we'll just put that that way in the minutes. Any questions on this? Any comments? Okay, would you call the roll? Councillor Hoy. Aye. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Motion passes. We'll go on to our next public hearing on the uh, 2022 City of Salem budget. That's right. The City of City Council will now hold a public hearing regarding the fiscal year 2022 City of Salem budget. The hearing will begin with staff presentation followed by public testimony. Thank you. Okay. Josh, are you the? I am. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, before I begin, I'll declare a potential conflict of interest as there are certain projects throughout the city, namely within the capital improvement program that could potentially benefit my family. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else getting anything out of this? Okay. Go ahead, Josh. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Oregon Public Budget Law requires the Budget Committee re recommend the budget to the City Council 
which did it, it did on May 5th, 2021. Changes were made to the city mayor's proposed budget by the budget committee, either through errata sheets or by other committee motions. The city council is required to hold this public hearing on the recommended budget. Notice of this evening's public hearing was published in the Statesman Journal on June 3rd, 2021. <clears throat> Following the public hearing, staff recommends the city council deliberate on the recommended budget within the restrictions provided in law, which are property taxes cannot be increased from the rate levied by the budget committee and no funds expenditures can be increased by more than 10%. <clears throat> Within these restrictions, the city council may make changes to the recommended budget and following deliberations of the budget, the city council is asked to approve any changes to the budget this evening to allow staff time to return with a resolution to adopt the budget on June 28th. At that time, staff will dash Ask the city council to amend the budget approval made this evening to include any pre-budgeted purchase orders or carryover projects from 2021. A complete list of carryover items will be included in the fiscal 2022 budget will be provided at the June 28th meeting. The total recommended budget is displayed on this slide, 662.6 million. This chart shows the city budget by results area and as, as you know, for the last several years, we've organized the budget within these results areas. I wanna walk you through the budget committee additions as well, <laughs> excuse me, as well as things that have been suggested since then. Um, it's a, a different budget public hearing this year. Usually it's pretty much exactly what the budget committee recommended, but there's more flux this year with ARPA funds and other things. The budget committee added these four programs, the limited duration DEI position, matching funds for a mobile response unit, simulcast Spanish for ASL, uh, for Spanish and ASL, and then an amount to be determined for the police body worn camera program. Very good. In addition to the budget committee recommended budget, there are several other items staff would like to highlight for inclusion in the budget also. The first item would increase revenues and expenditures in the trust funds. <clears throat> the U.S. Treasury produced an interim final rules as well as the final allocation amount for ARPA or the American Rescue Plan Act. <clears throat> and the city's final allocation was 1.2 million higher than previous estimates. It is recommended to add this amount to the ARPA reserve for future use. <clears throat> the second item was requested by the budget committee it would add approximately 800, or it would add 816,400 to the police general fund budget for the implementation of a body worn camera program. The program, <laughs> excuse me, includes the purchase and support of 190 cameras, as well as four full time positions dedicated to support the evidence records and storage for the program. The position count is conservative and may not take four full time positions, but since we need authority for the positions from council, we are asking for it now. If the positions are not needed, they will not be filled. So Josh, just, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but if you go back uh, then one page, you have a sort of a blank number for, or did I misunderstand it? The, yeah, the blank number, number to be determined. Is that what you're telling us then? It's a to be determined number. Do I get that? Yeah. The, uh, the budget committee added the program without a number attached. So now the staff has come up with a number. So we'd like council to approve it. The 835? 816, uh, 600. Whatever it was, I'm sorry. Yep. Okay. And that's a year's operation as well as the cameras themselves. Uh, that's correct. So the 816,400 is for the first year. After the first year, it drops to about 630,000 uh, because you don't need a per you don't need that initial purchase and training for the cameras. Josh, we're also asking state and federal uh, representatives about trying to get this program into uh, either state or federal budgets. Uh, we're not obligated to spend this if we get some new money in from somewhere else. Is that is that how it works? No, we wouldn't be obligated to okay. spend this. It would be at council and the city manager discretion. Okay. The, uh, the third item is a request for two full-time positions as a re uh, result of the police performance assessment. Currently a sworn officer is assigned to fleet management and accreditation 
but the assessment made it clear that more positions were needed in the field and this work can be done by a civilian physician. Uh, so one of the positions will take over these responsibilities that administrative analysts want a lower cost civilian position and that officer can return to patrol. The second position is a police lieutenant to focus on community engagement, as you heard what the chief uh, said in his presentation earlier tonight. The, uh, the fourth item was recently discussed at a council meeting to better support the Youth Services Care Corps program, and the information report is included in your, in your uh, agenda packet. Uh, this next slide is a little bit different. We're gonna talk about the American Rescue Plan Act allocation within the city budget and some considerations for the use of those funds. Uh, these first two are for one-time expenses, which are the ideal use of the ARPA funds. The first would be to reimburse the general fund for the use of half a million dollars of contingency in fiscal year 2021, which was used to contribute to the hotel purchase as part of Project Turnkey. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's to buy a hotel to uh, shelter unsheltered individuals. Uh, the city's contribution is 8.4% of the total purchase price of the hotel of 5.95 million. Uh, the second item is the purchase of a building for use as a navigation center. Last month, the city received $5 million, a $5 million operating grant from the state legislature for the first two years of operations. This action would purchase and construct any needed tenant improvements for use as a navigation center. In addition to the one-time acquisitions, there are several sheltering projects for your consideration. The total... <laughs> The total amount for fiscal year 2022 is 4.6 million with the balance of ARPA used to continue some of those programs continuing to fiscal year 23 and 24. Some of the details and amounts are still in the flux and they may change. So the focus is more on the amount of 4.6 million for sheltering than on one of, than on the specific projects. The next three slides focus on the general fund and highlight the considerations for you this evening. We see this as an opportunity to share the, this important information with you. I wanna make sure you understand the impact and future implication of the general fund budget you are considering tonight and approving in two weeks. On the slide, this graph is only for the general fund. Uh, there's about 24 other funds that we're adopting, but as you know, a lot of the focus is on the general fund. <coughs> Uh, the first column in gray is the current year that is ending in a couple weeks. If you take a look at the beginning fund balance of 25 million, then the use of 2.5 million at the bottom fiscal year impact row, right down here, that gives us the beginning fund balance for the proposed 2022 budget, uh, beginning in also just two weeks. The other four rows in gray are the forecasted years that balance out the five-year forecast. The rest of the rows that we'll display over the next three slides are color-coded with the ARPA allocations in orange, which display the revenues in the upper row, right up here, and the expenditures in the lower three rows. The budget committee additions in blue and the uh, two additional considerations for you this evening in yellow. This first display is without any additional ARPA funding or any additions to the proposed budget. This base budget would consume 3 million of fund balance next year, as well as forecasting the continued use of fund balance in the future. And you can see that in this bottom row here. In the second slide, the scenario B, uh, the blue highlighted rows uh, include the committee, budget committee additions and include the limited duration EI position, the simulcast dollars, and the mobile response unit match. Without ARPA funding and adding all these requests, except for, sorry, uh, the use of fund balance would be 1.2 million more in fiscal year 2022 for a total of 4.2 million use of fund balance at the bottom of the green column, an additional 3.3 million throughout the balance of the years. And please let me know if you have questions. Well, I, I do, Josh, on, as I look at this, 
Well, it looks like you have an, an item C. I think I'll wait till you're done. I want to kind of understand what we're buying here for a minute. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Uh, this display, this uh, slide C displays all the changes for your consideration this evening. So if you were to say uh, to adopt the budget as presented this evening, this is what it would look like. The ARPA sheltering request, as I mentioned, includes both the revenues and expenditures, but the other items are simply additional expenditures. You can see the ARPA <clears throat> funds in the top orange long line run out of the 10.7 ARPA reserve by fiscal year 2024, and it balances for the first three years with the other expenses in orange. For this display, the navigation center and other sheltering programs on this slide are continued into the out years of the forecast adding 3 million to the annual use of fund balance for a total of 8.7 million, beginning, <coughs> being the structural imbalance in fiscal year 2026. You can see that the navigation center operating costs are being covered by the state grant for the first few years, but we show it in the last two years of the forecast. The community action agency is looking to secure operational funding after the state grant is depleted, but we included it just to be conservative. Uh, even with the additional expenditures in next year's budget, fiscal year 2022, that you're considering tonight, <clears throat> the budget adds 4.9 million to the fund balance, but the use of fund balance starts back in the very next year and continues throughout the forecast period at an escalated rate. The main takeaway from this slide is that yes, we can add these services, but a commitment for additional revenue is needed in order to continue them and other services in the general fund. Then I have I have one more slide, and then maybe questions at that point. I do want to ask just a little okay. bit for a second. Go so ahead. what you're telling us kind of is ARPA is buying us. Are you saying it's buying us about five years, four or five years? I'd say it's buying you about two and a half years. Yes. Two and a half years, yeah. and then we cross out of our. Uh, do we go out of our policy confines on? Uh, Oh, yeah, so, so this on reserves. Yes, that's correct. So this next slide displays that fund balance policy in each of the scenarios. Okay. <clears throat> so, so the, go ahead. Well, Josh, it, it sounds like under current funding, we need a, about a crisis every two and a half years, then a major, you know, COVID. Uh, a wildfire that burns half the city or something that gives us a, a, a substantial financial kick or we're going to be in trouble. Yes, and that's the that's the, the trick there is asked to come with revenue. Often uh, they don't. So Yeah, yeah, this is kind of unusual. It is. Okay. Uh, so just to just to go a little bit more into what you're talking about, the, the council fund balance policy is 15% of budget revenues. That's shown here in the top row. So ideally, in the general fund, we would have this amount of cash on hand uh, in a couple of weeks when we end the fiscal year. Um, and th this is important for a few reasons. The first is the largest revenue source in the general fund is property taxes, which uh, I'm sure you, you get the notice in the mail around October uh, to pay it. We don't get that large influx of revenue until November. So we have to be able to cash flow general fund operations from July to October until that large payment from the two counties. Uh, the second reason is uh, is for unforeseen needs. Um, we've seen that the last couple of years and it's a good thing we had those reserves uh, between ice storms, wildfires and the pandemic. Uh, the, third, the third reason uh, is if your reserves or fund balance go down without a plan to bring them back up, the credit rating agencies may lower your credit rating and the interest rates on the city's borrowing will go up. Your cost of borrowing for bonds will increase. Uh, the, the, uh, and just to orient just slightly, um, so these, these rows here, they represent the Indian fund balance for each of the previous three slides. So this last one is the one with everything included, including the ARPA funds. And this is why I said, Mr. Mayor, about the, the two and a half years because you, you meet the council policy with this uh, this scenario until after 2024. So you need to make some kind of revenue action prior to that in order to maintain compliance. How, how substantial a revenue action are you talking then? In about two and a half years, the council will have to do what? 
Great question. <clears throat> so if we go back to this slide here, the fiscal year impact, this is revenues minus expenses. So this is your structural imbalance. Uh, so to think of it a different way, um, this is how much you're eating into your reserves or you're adding to your reserves. So in this case, you're adding 4.9 million next year due to ARPA one time. But then you start eating into your reserves, 3.8 million, 5.2 million, 7.5 million, then 8.7 million. So this is a substantial amount of money uh, for that structural imbalance. And of course, we're talking forecast. Um, you know, some assumptions go up, some go down. But in general, uh, we know that we have an issue coming up. Yeah. And if I may, Mr. Mayor, to give Josh a break, uh, he's been working some long hours, and you can hear it in his voice. Uh, thank you, thank you, Josh. Why don't you take thank a you, sip Josh. of water? Uh, I, I think another way to look at the question is also uh, because this isn't necessarily new uh, for council, and council took a very, uh, uh, you know, from a staff perspective, you know, very heroic uh, step by by approving the operations fee. Uh, and while, as Josh said, the or as you said, Mayor, uh, that you know uh, we need a good crisis uh, every few years. You know, un you know, unfortunately, the pandemic was a significant crisis, and there was federal uh, money uh, to help with that crisis, which really hit the city uh, at the level of sheltering and helping our unsheltered residents. And I think in addition to the numeric analysis that Josh has shared with you very competently, uh, a consideration is also on top of our existing needs, the service needs, uh, we now have clearly uh, been given the responsibility of, of, of sheltering. So that, that's a, an additional uh, issue that I, I think we need to work through over the next uh, next year or two to, to, to figure out so we are able to sustain uh, city services. Yeah, we've had this really unusual, at least for the past several years, uh, almost unique relationship with the state legislature we'd really never had before in terms of their willingness to participate with us in some of these larger policy and cost items. Uh, and, and the question I think will be in part how can we sustain that as well to help us pay for some of these ongoing costs over time? Um, yeah, it's gonna be, be interesting. You're not recommending anything this year then to, to try to backfill, get us out three years or four years then? Or do you think you can make some of it up in savings during the next uh, year or two? The, uh, the forecast does assume a uh, level of savings. So we do have that built in uh, oh, yeah. okay. in the road right above net expenditures. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I know that the currently the finance committee is uh, looking into a couple initiatives that'll get to you guys eventually at the council level. Okay, great. Well, Tom, it's all on your shoulders, man. <laughs> Are there any, any other questions on this part of the... Yes, Chris. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to confirm either with Josh or the city manager, my understanding of the ARPA situation, that this isn't going to be our last conversation about ARPA, that we'll have an opportunity to address this again in the coming weeks and months. And uh, so I just wanted to confirm that that's correct. And then I also have a comment, if that, assuming that's correct. Uh, yes, that is, is correct, Councillor. Uh, I... I am recommending uh, the budget officer, the statutory budget officer is, is recommending that council adopt the budget. Uh, the ARPA funds, uh, I think will be an opportunity for council to, to you know, revisit uh, policy decisions you've made uh, to confirm that that is the right direction or to perhaps modify. I, I do though want to, uh, uh, and I, I think the, the charts uh, show it that you know, perhaps unlike when we were initially uh, provided this this federal opportunity, uh, you know, first the sheltering crisis is eating up a lot of that uh, a lot of that federal money, and then the federal money is also helping us sustain our services over this five-year forecast. So the opportunities you know, might be much smaller 
uh, than, than we anticipated uh, three months ago. But I think, yes, there will be that opportunity for council perhaps later this summer uh, to revisit uh, the best uh, uses as determined by council of those ARPA funds. Thank you, Mr. Manager, that's very helpful. <clears throat> I just sort of want to throw it out there as kind of a, to put it on everybody's radar screen that I intend to come back at some point with a very modest request to sort of help the Mid Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance uh, take their work sort of the, to the next level based on some of the conversation we had at our recent work session. I've engaged with the staff there to talk about actually answering uh, Councillor Stapleton's question in a more uh, detailed way in terms of what could we do to take their work to the next level, which I think will ultimately hopefully reduce these costs uh, in the long term as right now we're really focused on managing homelessness. I really want to also put some good work on ending homelessness, which is where I think the Homeless Alliance can help us. So I just wanted to throw it out there for everybody's consideration that when we have that future conversation, I intend to have a, a very modest package that will help uh, hopefully work us towards ending homelessness as well. Yeah. I, I think along with that, Chris, we've had, we, we seem to be having more productive conversations with the county uh, lately too, in terms of finding new and different ways to uh, cooperatively fund some of these programs as well. I, I hope we do have chances to kind of keep adjusting on this. Mr. Manager, I think that's really going to be useful. Okay. Would it be uh, okay if I just made a brief go? Yeah, you, you go ahead. So, um, uh, City Manager Powers and, and Budget uh, Director uh, Josh Eggleston, uh, thank you for presenting this. Um, it's not all on Tom Anderson to fix us in two and a half years. He's got several of us counselors helping him on the Finance Committee. Excellent. Uh, but I, I just want to take the time to say that I really, as a new city counselor, I feel like what I wanted to see us, you know, there's a saying that uh, a budget is a moral document. And I really appreciate what the city staff have presented us with in terms of uh, taking advantage of this historic, uh, you know, unexpected funding that we got through ARPA to try to uh, make a difference, a real world difference in funding more managed shelter options in our community. For the past two years in a row, it's been the number one things on the, the satisfaction survey that the community members identify as their biggest issue is addressing houselessness. So seeing this tonight, I, I can't remember being this excited about seeing some, you know, nominal but real hope in our near future. Um, now, I, it's my understanding from city staff, this is probably the closest I'll get to a question, is that while there's $4.6 million in total through a variety of recommendations that are uh, allocated for in this document, that if we can't fund something like the the gospel that with the, the, the old mission down um, you know, by the waterfront, if that doesn't work out, that we could then use those funds for something else. But this is our best bet right now on real world things that we could fund in the near future to make more managed sheltering. Is that is that correct? Uh, yes, and I, I would point out uh, the recommended budget before you this evening would actually be a, over $8 million uh, spend on on helping our unsheltered residents between the assistance with the hotel purchase by community action and then uh, the city uh, purchasing a building for the navigation center and yes I would uh, for the second for the third piece the uh, the list of of managed shelters including the current Portland Road shelter I, I would ask that council view that as kind of a, a, a as an amount and not the specific uh, shelter amounts, because those numbers will will likely be changing as we continue to do due diligence. Uh, but I think it is a very good, else it wouldn't be in the in, in the budget uh, recommendation, it is a very good estimate at, at the level of spending uh, that the city will need over the next uh, 12 months. Well, th thank you for that. And if I could just follow up, I think you've done a great job of balancing what the community wants to see um, with this, you know, this historic opportunity of having these ARPA funds um, in, in terms of budging this out and making a difference with these, you know, funds that we have to spend in the next two and a half years um, in our community. So, you know, keeping our budget whole through 2024 um, and not going in and depleting the, the general fund reserves, I'm, I'm really impressed and I, I like what I'm seeing. Thank you. 
Uh, Councillor Stapleton. Thank you so much. Um, yes, thank you so much, Josh, for all this work pulling this together. I really appreciate it. Um, and sorry that the sun is setting, so it's kind of blinding me every once in a while here. Um, just a quick question on, uh, we don't have line items here, but on the body-worn um, camera program, the point eight, which is, I'm guessing that's the buying of them, and then the point six um, in the years following up, um, I guess this is kind of a complicated question. So. I knew about the two additional positions that we were looking at, the assistant, I'm forgetting the names of them, and the lieutenant that we were looking at, but then we also have four additional positions. Is that what we're looking at? Yes, that's correct for the body worn camera program. Uh, oh. And we're not quite sure if there'll be uh, a mix of IT and police, but we're looking at evidence and records personnel to manage the uh, processing of those, uh, the footage basically and the storage. Okay, great, thanks. I think that's really important to uh, lay out for people so they fully understand um, what they're getting um, with the program and what the program takes in order for us to support it financially. Um, and so that point six is that continued support of staff that continues to support the program. Um, and I'm guessing that uh, periodically we'll need to have another investment for updating the actual cameras. Do you know how often that is going to need to be addressed? <clears throat> Actually, the, the current quote, and we're not sure if this would actually be the vendor we'd choose, it includes a refresh of the body-worn cameras. Uh, okay. So there's no uh, investment every every five years or something like that. It's included in the support. Okay, that's good news. Thank you so much. It's a lot of information here to take in, so thanks. Cool. Hey. Yes, Trevor? Sorry, I just I forgot one other point. It's probably redundant, but... I mean, this is like the number one thing on the policy agenda has been the funding of a navigation center. And we're, we're seeing it, you know, budgeted out so that we're getting the one-time funds to build it. And then we're getting operation costs, you know, covered by the state legislature. I, like you, Mayor Bennett, am really hopeful that potentially the, the state legislature could continue funding that, you know, going past 2024. Um, that would also help us, you know, stay in the the black, I'm not an accountant, but I think that's correct in terms of our budget. So it's another historic thing, you know, the ARPA funds making a difference in managed shelter and getting that navigation center. It's just such an encouraging night. Yeah, I'm, I'm really hopeful and we'll also, uh, I know along with you, uh, Councillor, uh, that we'll see the sobering center find its support for, for operations in the next year or so. Uh, and, and I'm also hopeful, I'll tell you, uh, and I hope you all will keep track of this over the years, that uh, the state and federal governments who have been so committed on uh, body cameras and other kinds of police related uh, equipment and reform uh, develop programs that assist us in paying for the expensive uh, process of maintaining these records and stuff. If there's a way to, to find funding for that, uh, I think that would be a really great place to go looking for money is from, from those folks. But I really am hopeful on this, uh, Trevor. I am really hopeful on the uh, on the uh, sobering center this year. I, I this year or next year, I really am. We it's definitely a need in our community. It really is. It's the one thing that comes up first. You know, it it just when you're talking to the people in the business, it's well, you, where's the sobering center and why isn't it open? And where's your mental health facility and why aren't they open? So. We're working on those really hard to find our way through that, I think. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Powers, thank you very much for the work. I guess no one else has any questions. Uh, Jackie, did you have some? I'm um, not me, but Councillor Stapleton's had her oh, hand there up. There she is. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to take the moment to thank um, Steve for putting in um, our care core information and, and putting that into the budget. It's just really, really um, encouraging, and I just um, I love reading about the program, and and I'm so excited talking with um, different staff members about what this could look like in the future, and um, just see so much support for young families and for our BIPOC community with this program. Um, it's really encouraging, and and I, I can't wait to see what that's going to look like in the coming years. So thanks for for putting that in here and and taking it taking it to the next step. Okay, so. I'm going to close the public hearing unless there's more. Hey, Mayor, we yes. do have one individual signed up, uh, Dylan McDowell. Oh, God, Dylan. I'm sorry, Dylan. 
Not I a problem. Again. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Hello, Council. Uh, I'll be very brief, and I appreciate oh, your time tonight. Oh, um, uh, for those of you that I have not made this face yet, my name is Dylan McDowell, and I'm here on behalf of the Salem Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, or SPRAB. At our meeting last Thursday, we voted to uh, request the Council fully approve the budget request, including recommendation for parks. Um, our letter was only submitted this morning due to some scheduling with our own meeting, so uh, we felt it prudent for me to show up and just provide verbal testimony on behalf of that letter and really underscoring that there's been an immense value of parks and facilities, programs, services, and everything for the last year for all Salem residents. I know many of you are avid park users yourself. I've seen some of you out there. And um, we also just really want to acknowledge our appreciation for council. It has been um, no secret that there have been many, many, many challenges for the parks in the past year. And I know that Council has put a lot of time and effort into addressing these issues, paid a lot of attention to it, and we really appreciate that and appreciate the partnership. We're excited to continue, continue working with you and uh, to maintain and improve our park system, both in this budget and future requests. And uh, we appreciate your full consideration of the parks uh, line items and par parks requests um, this year. So thank you all very much and appreciate your consideration. Great. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you very much for your patience. Damon, have any questions for Dylan? Well, great job you guys are doing. Thank you so much for the Thank you. time it takes and the work you all do. It, it really keeps us well informed and on the right track. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Is there anyone else? All right. Um, I'm going to uh, close the public hearing. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move the City Council direct staff to return on June 28, 2021 with a resolution to adopt the budget committee recommended FY 2022 City of Salem budget. Second. Second by Lewis. Any discussion? No. No. Great budget, Mr. Powers. Thank you. Thank you and the city staff for the tremendous work you did with us on this. Thank you. Okay. The recorder, please call a roll. Councillor Nordyke. Aye. Councillor Lewis. Aye. Councillor Stapleton. Aye. Councillor Anderson. Aye. Councillor Phillips. Aye. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Gonzalez. Aye. Councillor Hoy. Aye. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Okay. Motion passes. We'll move on then to uh, information reports. Any, any comments? Yes, Councilor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I seem to be on a little tree kick this evening, but I do have a question for Mr. Wright or maybe Mr. Pankow, if he's here on item number 6B. Um, this is a, uh, a comprehensive zone change uh, in uh, Ward 5, and Condition 8 that was uh, uh, mandated was provide street trees to the maximum extent feasible along the frontage of Portland Road Northeast. I'm just curious as to what the maximum extent feasible means. Does it mean under the city code? Does it mean under good arborous practices, or does it mean what they can afford financially. I just don't know what maximum extent possible means. I'd like to have that explained to me. Uh, yes, Councillor Anderson, Norman Wright, Community Development Director. Lisa is here with us in the meeting. And so for that bit of nuance, I think she could be the best to explain and answer your question. Lisa? Great. Hi, Lisa Anderson, I'll be your planning administrator. Um, that's actually the language straight out of the city code. Um, so we don't requ require trees, you know, every 40 feet or 20 feet or something. Um, we do have design standards, Public Works does, and basically it's every 20 feet for certain types of trees or 40 if they're trees that are going to grow bigger. Um, so when we put that condition, we're just saying when you come in for your plans, Public Works is going to review it and they're going to determine that you've planted as many as you can, meeting the spacing requirement for those type of trees and then spacing, you know, from driveways 
pipes, you know, that kind of stuff. So they're going to do their review. So no, it's not, it's not based on how many they want to put or how much money they want to spend. Uh, we make them plant as many as can fit in that area. Well, that's very good because I did have some concerns. We've had these issues with the white oaks and can you, is it economically feasible to leave them in or is it not economically feasible? So you have to take them down, but I'm glad to see there's no question of money here, just a question of feet and uh, statutes. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions on information reports? Very good, then I don't see any other business before us. So if there's no objections, we'll adjourn. So thank you very much. <laughs>